All right, and we're back for uh, another episode of Bonding with Mark and Andy. We are diving into the history of Ian Fleming and James Bond and everything that is associated with this fascinating character that my friend Mark is uh, cajoled me into getting into this world, this Bond universe. Because you've never bothered to sit down and watch a Bond film, Andy. <laughs> which, Mark, I'm a busy man. I know you are, but even so, you've had such a long time, you've never got around to it. It's very strange. <laughs> How is uh, let's do a couple of little niceties. How is England treating you today? How what's the weather England like over is there? Quite nice. We've been having nothing but rain and bad weather, but for August, it's looking quite nice out there at the moment. Makes a change. Yeah, we've got uh, we've had rain uh, a little bit here in Nashville. This yeah. is the uh, first of August, right? Are we in August now? Shit, what, what are we? We had Storm Anthony yeah. here yesterday. That was a joy. Yeah, uh, we we actually had a little brief power outage here, uh, which was just a, a flicker nothing major but uh yeah storms rolled through here last night in nashville and i guess they're heading your way eventually yeah, i don't know we've, for the end of july beginning of august the english summer has been dreadful really yeah bad. but we soldier on we do we move on i mean luckily i have a bunch of bond films to keep me occupied you do. i don't know what you're, you're doing i don't know if you're re-watching them or not but uh i've got plenty to do with that you being do. said so we're we're doing some history of Bond because I don't know it and Mark seems to do. So I know a little. Yeah, we'll go from here, and if uh, I'm sure someone will probably chime in. Uh, our friend uh, was it Tom Shapin. He, uh, he knows he, he knows a little Bond. He might chime in here and there. And anyone else that wants to join us on this conversation, I know another friend of ours. Um, we call him Orion. He wants to join us one day and talk about the vehicles of James Bond. Um, which I look forward to because the cars are another whole character in the movie. Cars are characters in themselves. Yeah. I can't wait to dive into that. But we left off talking a little bit about Bond's. I want to finish up with Bond's family, or Bond, Ian Fleming's right. family. Uh, Mark, you can give me some details if you have them. He was married just once, right? Just, Is that correct? One. There were lots of affairs in his youth. I mean, if you take the time to have, have a look at his life story. I think Ian Fleming, much like his creation, was a bit of a ladies' man. But he ended up having an affair with a woman called Anne O'Neill, who was married to Viscount Rothermere, I think, Lord Rothermere. Yes. A member, member of the right British now. aristocracy. But Fleming ended up having an affair with her. So she um, ended up marrying Ian Fleming. And I think Casino Royale was his way of distracting himself from the wedding. He'd go off and write that during the day while she was. Yeah. Writing. I, I think, think I read that. That that was his yeah. his, uh, his his nerves or his cold feet. I think but... Fleming was a confirmed bachelor, and then suddenly found found himself getting very rapidly married. So yeah, I think that's where and, Bond was born. Uh, so him. let me ask you just uh, out of curiosity, because uh, um, over here in America, I don't know what the second uh, Viscount or Viscount Rotham or what 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 does all that mean. Oh, I don't know. Is, is it part of this royal lineage and he's yeah, somewhere? Earls, dukes. Okay. Lord this, lady that. Yeah, it's all part of the English aristocracy. Do we call you Lord Greenaway? You could do, but you probably get laughed at. <laughs> That's quite good, though, Lord Mark. I quite like the ring of it. Mark. Yeah, uh, he, was, he was involved with a member of the British aristocracy and they had an affair and then they got married, which was what, 1952, 53, I think. So. And then they had one child, is that correct? Uh, yeah, one uh, baby boy called Casper. Casper. Who later, he paid, uh, he died, am I correct? Uh, Casper died. I think he his... died quite young, yeah. I think he died before Fleming, I think. Yeah, I think he was in his, uh, I had the notes I, somewhere, but I think I he was in his remember. 20s. Yeah, I can't remember why he died, but I think, yeah, he died quite young. Let me see if I have it in my notes here real quick. I may or may not. I probably don't. Oh, I can't remember what, what that was all about. I don't, but someone will I'm surely chime in and tell us where we went wrong. But yes, his son died. And then uh, they married. Now, they they lived there in London. Am I correct to assume? I think, yeah, I think they spent time in London and out in Jamaica. Jamaica, Jamaica so that was... Hot that was like his like summer home or a summer vacation? home. Yeah, he used to he'd take three months off a year to go and write. I think that was part of his contract when he worked for the Sunday Times. So they'd go out to his house in Jamaica and God, have parties with Noel Coward and have a grand old time. I think, Can you imagine that life he lived? I know. Like, lovely, 
imagine having a job where you say to your boss, like, I need three months off in the summer. I need, I need three months off a year to write my, my novels. I'll see I'm you. I'm going to go. I'll see you in I'm, April. Yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, would you say he his his word output was, and he would sit and write, was... um. Didn't he say? I think he was. He sat down and did two thousand words a, a morning or something like that. He just keep writing. Wouldn't look back at it. Wouldn't edit it. Just get it written. Two. And that's a great way to write a book, isn't it? Well, I mean, you know, you and I were just talking off camera about <laughs> our inability to accomplish uh, little, if anything. And you think about this guy, Ian Fleming was. First of all, you got to go to. If I'm in Jamaica. I'm not thinking about sitting down writing a book. Like I'm at the beach every day. I, well, I've never been to Jamaica. Have you ever been that? Well, no, I mean, you've done some world travels. Although I have, there was a, there was an exhibition in London. I think it was called Bond in Motion, and they had lots of artifacts and and props from the movies and stuff. And they had they've made a, a, a reconstruction of his room at Golden Eye, and there was his desk and his chair. And a typewriter on it. So, you, you, and it was just a very simple wooden desk, very simple wooden chair. And yeah, he apparently used to sit there and knock out two thousand words a, a morning. Or yeah, something. and, and think about using uh, using a typewriter. Like we have MacBooks, and I can't yeah. be bothered to help finish my research so, for this. To podcast. write a two thousand page manuscript on a manual typewriter, that's 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 quite a big ask. And, and apparently, you know, years later, he, apparently Fleming had a he had a gold typewriter. It was a gold-plated typewriter that he used to write these things on. And oh. years later, Pierce Brosnan bought it at auction. So I think Pierce Brosnan owns Ian Fleming's oh. golden typewriter. I think that's the story. Oh, that's great. Mm. Gold uh, it kind Fleming of lends to uh, Goldfinger, does, does it? Exactly. Not? And do you know, did he... I, I mean, we, we didn't discuss this earlier, but do you know anything about his writing habits? Like, did he, did he outline or did he just kind of go for it i think there were yeah notes got an idea of what he wanted to do and then he just sat down and wrote it just just banged it out and then went back and had a look at it afterwards and knocked it into shape it's a great way to truly, write a book truly i mean it, it just lends to his uh his talent and and you know i'm i'm happy that i finally discovered him uh even though late in life i did discover him because i've read some interviews in doing research for these things and some of these some of these massive fans one of the guys who actually became one of the writers after bond um i'm gonna draw a blank on his name was it richard benson uh, raymond benson did something raymond yeah. benson. benson he was reading bond novels at like 13 mm. and uh, i picked up i think my first i was about 12 something like that when i first like it was because of the movies on tv and then i yeah got the books and started reading I, I had not at thirteen. There was no way I was ever going to read a novel. At thirteen, I was uh, well. You were too busy painting Kiss and painting your face. At I was painting my face with mm -hmm. Kiss makeup, and I had just discovered our mutual fan band uh, Night Ranger at thirteen. Oh yes, I've heard and of them. And I was um, uh, this is, I get another tangent here, but I was a, uh, I was a, a drummer, and I wanted to be a rock star, and uh, reading. Had uh, I had no interest in reading. I was no I was trying to, to read. I was reading music, man. I was playing songs and dreaming of the Lamborghini I was going to buy someday. Um, quick update: I'm still waiting on the Lamborghini, but I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> Although now I kind of want to. Uh, uh, what is it? A Sunbeam? Oh, the Sunbeam Alpine. I want. I, I kind of want. I want one of these things. It's a cool little car. Yeah, there's some lovely cars to come. He's driven some yes. fabulous cars. Yeah, well, and we will have our friend Orion on to discuss mm -hmm. the cars with us because he is a car buff. And, he is a car buff. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm a car buff in the sense of I like – there's a couple cars that I really enjoy, but I can't speak intelligently about them. You know, I, I have a love for Lamborghini. I have a love for um, – I love for a Ferrari, basically the Italian sports cars. Fascinated by the um, – the MGs of your of your land, Mark. MGs. I had an MGB once. Beautiful yeah. car. Lovely pieces. Most unreliable piece of metal I've ever driven. <laughs> you could never guarantee that you were going to get to where you wanted to go because it was always overheating. Well, so the and you and I have talked about this before. And I know we're, we're drifting way off topic here, but you and I have talked before about when you came over here to the states and the big difference. Well, a big difference, not the, but one of the big differences over here is. You know, it seems to me in Europe, and I've been, I've traveled to Europe just a couple of times. I can't speak intelligently about Europe, but 
I the one thing I notice is it seems like over there Europeans have cars for a reason, just to get you from point A to point B. Point B. Yeah. Over here, we all want the biggest truck we can find. The bigger, there the are better. A lot of big vehicles in the states. But yeah, then everything it, in America is big. The journeys, the distances involved, yeah. it's all big. So you <laughs> need a big truck. We had to travel quite a bit to go to our a rock concert. Mm. But um, that's what I was so fascinated by the MGs is because, uh, and I, I used to work with a guy who owned one, and he was restoring it. And the same thing, like getting it to work, it took him like twice as long because he'd have to stop. Yeah. Because it was overheating, and he'd have to give it a minute and maybe put some yeah. water in it. But, you know, but he he's like, it doesn't, deter me he goes i love this car and if i have to stop every so often i stop he goes but i don't ever look back you know i don't it's all, regret it's it. all part of their charm they look great they smell great they sound great but yeah you know, they're slightly unreliable english cars of that era are very unreliable i used to carry a bottle of water in the back of my mg because you never need ne never knew when you were going to need it yeah that's what that's what he would say he goes you yeah. have to always because it just they would get hot uh anyway we've we've digressed anyway, we've enough digressed. So um, we know that Casper died. I don't have the details on that, and I apologize for that, but it's not super important to the storyline that we're doing here. He married uh, Anne. They had a kid, Casper. Uh, Ian, as we stated, he died uh, when he was 56. 56, after a round of golf in 1964. So the bomb moved, he'd seen Dr. No and From Russia With Love. Goldfinger was in the it was in the mix. It was being made, and yeah, he he went to play a round of golf at Sandwich Golf Club near Canterbury, and he yeah dropped down and had a heart attack. They rushed yeah, to Canterbury and Hospital. We're and actually we're coming up on the anniversary of his death. It was August twelfth. That's right. Yeah, sixty four. So we're sitting here at August sixth uh, as we record this right now. So uh, in a few days, we will make a nice post on our uh, website our facebook group to honor the, the man himself and he's um, buried a 20 minute drive from where i'm sitting now a little village called seven hampton seven hampton yeah. and, and now is that um is there a significance why he's buried there or is it just i don't know actually i'm I, i'm not aware of any significance but he his son and his wife are all buried in the same churchyard a little village called seven hampton just up the road 20 minutes from where I am now. I'd be curious someday to figure out what that's about. Maybe yeah, we can look that up. Um, so like you said, he made it to, he saw two of his books become movies. Yeah, they just, the movies had just come out, 62, Russia with Love was 63, and he died the following year. But never Apparently got to really. some rumor that he's actually in, in one of the railway scenes in From Russia with Love. I think when Bond's catching a train, he's in the background, apparently. Totally I will so. endeavor when I watch it later today or tomorrow. But he never got to really see the super success that he would. It he was would just do starting. Before. It was just beginning. Because what what I had read uh, in my research is that he did. He had he'd seen uh, financially some success. He, he yeah. they said, it was, and he died as his net worth was about three million pounds. Mm. Um, which that's pretty darn good. I mean, pretty I would take that. For for back then, but then he, he, he died before it. Well, I mean, Goldfinger is when it really took off and hit the roof. Yeah, so and he, he it, died just before Goldfinger came out. I think. Yes, and the fact that the series has gone on to rake in billions of dollars, and I only oh, yeah. hope that his his estate is still seeing that money. I don't know that it is. Maybe you can speak about that. Sure. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. His brother, I guess, his brother probably took over for most of it while he was alive, right, Peter? I don't if know. I, I, I presume. I, I presume. I think Anne outlived him, so I imagine she. Has yeah, some I don't have her her numbers. I, I I should have done that, but uh, we're really we're kind of winging this here a little bit. Um, so let's talk about uh, the Bond stuff. Is based on the MI six, correct? MI six, yeah, British secret, British secret service, and it's known as. Um, yeah, MI6. MI6 is for foreign problems, and MI5 is for domestic problems. So Bond being the international... Yeah, he's MI6. So do MI5, MI6 ever cross over in the books? Is there ever a, a working relationship? Do you I know think the, the one, movies? I think he goes to goes to a shooting range that's used by MI5 at some point. But yeah, there's. I mean, the, the two are quite interlinked, obviously. The, 
defending England and all that sort of thing. But MI MI six is who Bond works for, Secret Intelligence Service. S I S. Yeah, and that, and that is a real thing in England, the MI6 oh, yeah. designation. Yeah. Now, uh, the double O, is that a real thing, do you know? Or is that made up for um, the books? I mean, I think that he, that he came up with the double O section for the books, but I'm sure there is that kind of department that does exist for people who have Probably to not, in, the, in the line. They don't advertise the double O. But they don't advertise the fact, no. They keep that, that sort of stuff fairly quiet. There, the, was a, there was a story that, that all the inspiration for the bond name and for 007 apparently in the in the in the reign of elizabeth the first she had a, a spy network and one of her spies used to sign his he had a code number for her, the letters that he used to send to queen elizabeth and he used to sign it 0070 or something like that so there are all sorts of reasons why it could be double o but yeah he i think fleming created it it's it's, it's to complete complete your mission, if you need to kill someone in the line of duty, then you're allowed to. That's the double O section. Uh, it's just fascinating. Again, it's so iconic, you know. And what uh, didn't you tell me that he kind of took double O seven from? Uh, was it a train? There, there is a. I mean, Fleming died in Canterbury, where I come from, Kent, on the south coast of England. And for many, many years, the bus route, the number of the bus route from Canterbury bus. up to London has been 007. I've ridden the 007 bus many times. So, yeah, that, that exists. It could, that that exists. Story. it could be another one. But, yeah, it's around. There are, yeah, 007 and that, bus still exists. The bus route existed before Bond existed. Yeah. So, clearly, yeah. that's not a nod to him. The, the, the yeah. 00 was there ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's iconic. I mean, everybody, you know, you can just say 007 and people know what you're talking people about. People know it, yeah. It's become part of English and I, culture. And then you were also telling me, I believe that there's only, it goes up to like 009. Well, I, I think in the books there's three at any one time. But if you watch Thunderball, there's a scene where he walks into a meeting. They're having a meeting to discuss what's been going on. Two Vulcan bombers have been, uh, a Vulcan bomb has been stolen with two nuclear bombs on board. So they have this big meeting and they M gathers all the double O agents in and there's nine seats and the seventh seat is empty. And he, Connery walks in and sits down in it. So that in the, in the film Thunderball, you can see there are at least nine double O agents at, at, at that point. But I'm sure there are more. I love it. Uh, so it says, yeah, I'm going through the notes, uh, sticking with the number, the double O it says that the, the, the novel Moonraker, uh, in your notes, says that's where they established that the double O section routinely has three agents. Yeah, that's right. At any time. Yeah. So in, got the, in, that. In, the, in the in the films, there's been double O six, double O nine. So yeah. Yeah, and then one. yeah, your next note is in the series uh, in the film Thunderball. They established that the minimum number is of is nine. nine. Yeah. Probably because double O ten would not make. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't sound quite as good. Would it? It doesn't. Just, it's funny because 007 just really. It works, really, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it just, just works. It's just cool. I don't know. <laughs> what do works. I know, right? Uh, let's talk uh, briefly about. Uh, we've covered that. So the first. Let's talk about the first, I guess, the appearance of Bond in film. Or I'm reading your note here. 1954, CBS paid Ian Fleming $1,000, which would be. Um, yeah, the first James Bond appearance. The first he was an American. Yeah, uh, American TV series with Peter Lorre, the big. You remember the big film star? Um, he was in I, Multi Falcon, I think. Gosh, you know, I know there. the name. I cannot place it, and I'll and when I do the editing, yeah. I'll put a picture of Peter Lorre up here. There was a there was uh, a Daily Express newspaper strip over here that had that they did that. It was a cartoon strip with James Bond, but the first appearance on screen of Bond was an American TV show. Yeah. Apparently, I, I think he worked for the CIA, not the British government. He was a proper American. Well, of course, we've got to put our stamp on it. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen this version of Casino? Is it out there? Do you know? No, yeah, I think it's. I think you can see it on YouTube. I've never actually seen. I've seen, I've seen a picture of what he looks like, but I've not actually seen the TV show. So we'll make an effort to uh, both of us will watch that one day, and we'll do a. A, a, a late review of it. That was <laughs> in 50, I think that was fifty four, wasn't it? And the, the, it says the, 1954. The Daily, yeah, the Daily Express, the cartoon strip that was very big over here. That was nineteen fifty seven. 
and then it sort of snowballed from there. I think he did Doctor No. He was a was a script for the uh, a t it was a TV script for a film script for the Jamaican government to boost tourism or something. But it felt, really, and that's when he met Cubby uh, uh, Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli, and then well, so the movies came. Let me just finish up a note here. You have on the the American version of Casino Royale. Uh, it was part of something called its Climax series, which I don't know Climax what that means. Uh, it says it aired live on uh, October 21st, 1954, and it starred Barry Nelson, What's it, Barry Nelson? What's it? as Card Sense, Jimmy Bond, James, jo James Bond, and Peter Lorre as Le, sure? Le Chiffre, the big villain. Chiffre. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll find pictures of that and post them. They'll be on the, the episode when, it, when we air this thing. Um, I haven't read Dr. No. Was it set in Jamaica, I assume? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, we and that's one of the reasons, I think one of the reasons that they chose to to film Dr. No first was it was the the, loca the main location. It was all in one place. It was all in Jamaica, so it was cheaper. They could fly everybody out to Jamaica, film it there. It's one of the reasons they, they, they did that first. Yeah, we were because we were talking about that. And um, so it's all it, set in Jamaica. It, because it was such a, a small budget at the time. It was a million dollars. And like the um, the stage designer, he built like that massive lair and everything for like fifteen thousand, fourteen thousand mm. dollars, fourteen thousand mm. pounds. Yeah, when they and, first started, it was all on a very tight budget. Definitely. Yeah, and I read that I believe it was Kubrick. I could be wrong on this, but it's Kubrick who uh, then had him do the set design for. Was it 2001? I think when we consulted, they asked for his advice. Oh, Kubrick, yeah, did 2001. But I think he it was advised on it, yeah. Yeah, I'm really butchering this. I really should. It's, it's just so bloody early. I, I'm not done on my <laughs> research for this, Mark. Anyway, I'm kind of we're spitballing that part of it. But anyway, um, so let's see. I'm reading some notes that you've got here. The novel adapted for American audiences to show Bond as an American agent working for, quote, the combined intelligence, while the character Felix Leiter an American in the novel became British on screen. It was renamed Clarence. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. That must be for the, um, for the film Casino Royale. And uh, I'm trying to see what else you got. I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, yeah, Dr. No so, was written as a, as something to do with Jamaican tourism, something like that. And it fell through and then he met Harry Saltzman and it went from there. I think he got 50 grand for the, for the rights for, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to find it here in your uh I'm trying when we get to that part maybe we'll do that in the next episode we'll jump into the production parts of it um let's see here i think yeah so we'll talk some of the comic strips real quick odd uh in 1958 the novel moonraker was adapted for broadcast on south african radio that's right, with Bob Holness, who Bob is Holness. well known in England for being a game show host for a, a game show called Blockbusters, which was very big when I was a teenager. Okay, so what was that a, like? It was a slight, a slight oddity in the Bond history, but yeah, apparently Bob Holness, who's, who was very big over here when I was a teenager, a uh, cult figure, he did a TV show called Blockbusters. It was a, a quiz show, but it was quite right. popular here. Uh, when I found out he was James Bond, I was quite surprised. <laughs> Well, according to The Independent, quote, listeners across the union thrilled to Bob's cultured tones as he defeated evil master criminals in search of world domination, end quote. Sounds about right. Uh, in 1957, the Daily Express approached Ian Fleming to adapt his stories into comic strips, yeah, these offering cool. him 1,500 pounds per novel mm. and a share of the takings from syndication. Uh, after initial reluctance, Fleming, who felt the strips would lack the quality of his writing, agreed. Uh, he says also to aid the Daily Express illustrating Bond, Fleming commissioned an artist to create a sketch of how he believed That's James right. Bond looked. The illustrator, John McCluskey, however, felt that Ian Fleming's 007 looked too outdated and pre-war and changed Bond to give him a more masculine look. The first strip, Casino Royale, was published on July 7th, 1958 to December 13th, 1958. And was written by Anthony Hearn and illustrated by John McCluskey. Have you seen yeah, these they're, things? They're Mark? very popular over here. Yeah, you know we, the days of uh, the the serialized comic strips in the comic pages are kind of gone by the wayside. Yeah, I, now, I remember when I was still a young lad. Um, 
my parents would get the Sunday paper, which was the big paper here in the States. I don't know if the same way in, in England. Yeah, so. I mean, they'd get a daily paper, but the Sunday paper was your big, thick paper and had all your ads. And uh, But I would always get the funny pages, and I would do some flipping through them. I then uh, – that's where I just started, oddly, a, a, a love of comics and became a comic collector later in life. But uh, that, that didn't – that didn't get me anything in life. <laughs> that that and five bucks to get me five dollars worth of comic books. Keep going, Andy. Keep going. Yeah, I'll get there eventually. Someday, Mark. You gotta sit down and do two thousand words a morning like Fleming. That's what you're gonna do. Jesus. I don't think I've written two thousand words in my life. <laughs> it's impressive. Um well let's let's end this episode here, Mark, at this point and we'll when you get to up. the comic strip in the Daily Express, now you're talking late fifties. Yeah. It's all building towards 62 and when they get the film right so we're nearly, yeah, we're nearly so there. we'll pick up next where he starts to get into the film production and screen adaptations and uh saltzman and uh broccoli and we'll yeah. pick up from there on the next episode so uh thank you anybody Adam Roch from russia with love young man i am that will be our next movie review will be of course from russia with love coming up soon i hope but we're going to finish up these history episodes so um We'll say goodbye for now on this one, Mark, and we will pick up on the next one. with the little Farewell, with the Nashville. Diet. Have a good day. Bond on, my sir. Bond on. Take care. <laughs>